Greetings, Commanders, and welcome to episode 293 of Lave Radio, the show about the universe of Elite and the fantastic community that surrounds it. I'm your host, Commander Phoenix Defia, Chief Archivist of Lave Station, otherwise known as Colin Ford, and joining me in the Orange Side Render Bar for this episode, we have our Chief um, Bar Steward, Grant Psychocow Wilcott. Hello, peoples. We have our Head of Health and Safety, uh, Commander Edelweiss, that's Ben Moss Woodward. I am Brew. We have our Inhuman Resources Director, Commander Shan. Hello. And also joining us for this episode, we have the Community Relations Manager and co uh, presenter of the Loose Screws podcast, Commander Chig. Greetings from the colonies. <laughs> or as we like to call it, Hillbilly, Hillbilly Redneck Radio. <laughs> uh, already off to a good start. Yeah, right. I'm just thinking, hello, you traitorous scummy bastards. <laughs> That's Remember, a really I'm, warm I'm more, I'm, and, yeah, I'm in the know. northern sector of, of Hillbilly Radio, way north of... <laughs> well, that's of okay, apart from, apart from Shan, we're all northern too. When you said Hillbilly Radio, I sort of had the uh, the picture of the Dukes of Hazard with like Uncle Ben and <laughs> Bowen Luke clustered around a PC. Can I be Daisy? You want to be Daisy, or you, oh. would you like to be with Daisy? Yes. <laughs> I think we've now just worked out the whole of Ben's problems. <laughs> <laughs> If you wish, you can join us. We're hanging out in game in open, so probably around the orange side around the bar near the planet lave. Um, but if you can't get to us in game, you can also join us in the Twitch chat channel, which you can access through laveradio.com slash live and click on the live chat and at twitch tv slash lave radio. And um, I'm now thinking, I'm, I've got this image of Ben with those blooming um, denim shorts in my head, which is really making me feel ill. It's not, really it's like not short shorts. It, it's not not good. When you, so, need to, you need to worry, though, when Ben puts a pair of cow horns on the front of your ship. Oh, come on. Boss Hog it... had the cow horns, didn't he? Oh, of course he did. I was just, I was just there thinking, no, Ben's horny enough. We don't want anything more, do we? And anyway. Roscoe Ros- P. Colin. <laughs> can, can you get the Confederate flag in Elite? Oh, I hope not. I think you can. I think but, it was a it was a Viper or a Cobra ship skin thing a number of while ago. Yeah, the uh, <laughs> I think the the modern day association at the moment. Well, it's, it's yes. Shall we move on from there? <laughs> For I, I dig know. a big bear, dig a bear, a big hole. Um, right. So we'll go around the crew, see what they've been up to for the last week or so. Um, we'll start with. Uh, uh, Psycho Cow, how have you been, sir? I've been good. On that previous discussion there about the Confederate flag, no, not to oh, take it back. <laughs> you had to bring it back. Well, of course, away, but, well, going. no, not really. Uh, there's a, a wonderful TV show now. It came out of America and it is called uh, Mythic Quest Raven's Banquet and it's about game development, so it's like a game development studio. And mm-hmm. possibly the most, I mean, I talk about iconic moments in comedy television, like the IT crowd and their episode when they go to the theatre and see a show called Gay, happens to be one of the most painfully funny things in recent years. Well, I would reckon that Mythic Quest's Nazi episode, when they find out that they've got a group of Nazis using their game, and the techniques and things that they then put into the game in order to tackle it, with the backlash of your games basically encouraging, you know, the, the the Nazis, the worst possible community to form in their game, and they're supporting it and all this kind of thing. The usual kind of, you know, things that, again, parody what happens with Elite whenever they do an update and they get people going, oh, what, you put this in the game, and having the Confederate flag would be an opportunity for people to accuse them of um, supporting uh, all kinds of unpleasantness associated with the, the sort of and symbolism. F- and five and five minutes in, we have just invoked Godwin's law. There we go. Anyway... It's a great TV series. It's definitely worth checking out, and you will absolutely thoroughly. You know, Shan, I think you'd actually get a real kick out of it as well. The whole series just 
parodies our community and what we how are. How did you find it? Um, how did I find it? Oh, I can't say. Oh, where do you find it? Where, where do you find it? Is it do you know on what? YouTube? Is it? I don't know what network it's on. I'll find out. But it's definitely something to look out for. Mythic Quest, uh, Raven's Banquet. It's probably through some strange proxy service I've got. <laughs> totally and utterly above board and legal, honest gov. Um, but um, I'm not sure what network it's on. Mythic Quest, Raven's Call. Definitely worth a check out. And um, they are currently about to do a, a release of a special quarantine edition where they're going to kind of tackle uh, development in the current climate in a way that will hopefully make light of it and um, record the carry-on um, for future future people. I am currently in beta tonight, actually. For the, I've downloaded the beta today. I'm currently trying to make my way oh, over to, to Lave to see what's you know different in the beta, which so far is some interesting menu system differences. Uh, my carrier's there if you want to board it. Apple TV, says Karumba. Apple TV, thank you, Karumba. Yep, my carrier's still in leave if you would want us to pop in, Cal. Okay, excellent. Oh, I've never been to carrier. This should be cool. Um, so we'll do that live in the stream then. We'll go and have a look at a carrier. If you've not seen one, you've got opportunity. will strand you somewhere horrible. Ah, yes, beta, who cares? <laughs> <laughs> so the, there's that. Uh, other than that, um, we've been uh, dealing with the sort of uh, fallout of the effects of corona on uh, all... Oh, for flip's sake, it just crashed into a star. Screw this game, this is rubbish. Um, <laughs> rage quit, bloody purple bastards. Anyway, um, other than that, yeah, working on um, dealing with businesses and trying to keep things ticking over until next year. Um, oh, Eurobismal, that was the big one from the weekend. We ran the Eurobismal uh, song contest, the stay at home song contest, where we encourage people to register, get a random country assigned from the Eurovision countries. They then have to provide a YouTube video of a music for that country, and then we did a kind of mock uh, Eurovision song contest style show where we played all these videos and then it had people. Uh, vote for their particular favourites and I have to say it was a ton of fun it took hours <laughs> it took hours to get through but it was absolutely fantastic and um, so many bizarre choices we had Karumba who had a, a fantastic music video of these um, aged up people in a care home singing rock songs and encouraging all the uh, residents to dance on tables. Um, so there was just so much kind of fun little videos like that to uh, Lichtenstein uh, children's video about spiders with a very disturbing subplot. We had dodgy Mickey Mouse cosplay. We oh, It was just, it was full of everything. It was brilliant. Dodgy Mickey Mouse cosplay. Yeah, that wasn't the worst of it. Uh, we had oh, we had uh, a fantastic. I think it was a song called Free.mp3, which was all about copyright and music and internet memes, and it was a very clever video. We had giant eyeball videos. We had oh, what, that yeah, one. yeah. What was the one where the drum was basically drumming on people's bottoms? How come Ben had to go for that one? Um, I'm not sure if that was Free.mp3 or, or fetish, that was Midden's it? very dodgy um, S&M or BDSM uh, video with some very sort of suggestion, which was, of course, I think that was, um, was that Serbia? Which was I don't very know. close I've to lost, the call, I've whether lost or not it breached terms and conditions yeah. or not. I've um, lost my notes for, for the videos, so I, I don't have... But the have, winner, have my records. The winner, and I, I've got a wee clip that will play out at the end of the show. Uh, the winner <laughs> was Space Nerd, who was representing Iceland. Um, the scoring had <laughs> everything you could imagine from any Eurovision. We had in voting, we had blatant uh, in voting, we had uh, some just beautiful moments of where it was like, oh, hold on a minute, but that's, that's, you're right, so you just voted 12 points for your boyfriend, and then they voted 12 points for you. This is shocking, <laughs> shocking Greece and Italy, uh, sorry, Greece and Italy, Greece and uh, Cyprus again. Greece and Turkey. Yeah. Greece and Turkey both voting for Cyprus. 
Yeah, and so you just we had to, it was a good laugh, uh, and the uh, scoring and our our integration with the the, the sort of um, Twitch was was brilliant. And Tari's Fusions bot ran like a dream, allowing us to do live votes um, like never before. And it was perfect. Did the UK come last as it always does? No, no. Um, surprisingly not. Even though um, the representative uh, Sizzle Twenty One P did her best to try and <laughs> get it to last <laughs> with a a Bruce Forsyth song uh, backing Britain. Now I said backing, not back in. <laughs> but it's equally yeah uh, a very interesting anthem actually it was a lot of fun but there were so many good songs in there and it was just a, a real joy to go through all the ones apart from them two that were taken from the gold disc currently on Voyager where they should remain for all of eternity <laughs> never to return yeah, to I, this planet I have to admit I genuinely feel sorry for any aliens who pick up our <laughs> ship and decide to listen to that yeah. If that is the quality of music that we're giving them, you know, I, I, I've heard it. I mean, it's meant to have Beethoven and Strauss and you know a lot of other good songs. But what the hell were we thinking with them? We might it just could be spare worse. It, could be, <laughs> it could be worse. It could be taking medical advice and Donald. <laughs> Yep. Yes. So other than that, had, we're recovering. Have you had your daily injection of Dettol then? <laughs> uh, I've been injecting bleach straight into my eyeballs. Again, it explains so much. Hell, if you're going to do it, you might as well do it proper. So apart from um, injecting bleach into your eyeballs, what else have you been up to today? Uh, oh, this I'm horrified to say... I have rediscovered Civilization. Um, the game Civilization. Yep. Yes. Back back at university, I played Civilizations one well, so I definitely remember Civilization 2, and then Civ 3 Gold I got. Um, and then I got Civilization 4. I made the mistake of buying Civ 5 when it first came out, because I loved Civ 4. And I just, I played that and I was like, this is absolutely dog's bollocks. What the hell are they doing here? And I, I felt very burned by it, so I've avoided Civ VI. Um, but I, I've been hearing moderately good things about Civ VI. And then I found a place where I could get the Platinum Edition of Civ VI for less than £25 instead of £105. Yeah, and I thought, yeah, I'm gonna get that then. That that yeah, doesn't sound like a bit of a winner. Yeah, and I got that on. I want to say I got that on Sunday, and my playtime was about fourteen or fifteen hours already. Those are rookie numbers. Yeah, well, I have had sleep and work in the meantime. Uh, let me have a look at my playtime. Playtime, playtime, playtime. Six. So current playtime, eighteen hours. Oh, yeah. And I found out that Scotland, with in the form of Robert the Bruce, is in it as well. Oh right! Uh, so we've actually got our own power in that. Yeah, uh, oh. we have our own power. Um, I've played. What I've played. I'm. Oh well, I'm still playing my first game. Uh, but I kind of. I wasn't going to do it. I promised, but I might have. I might have gone off and annihilated England first. Um. But that's only because they turned to me first, so hey. Um, and then I tried. Then I tried picking on the Greeks and the Spanish, uh, but then they both said, "Yeah, well, you know what, guys, we want peace." So now we're going off and picking on Russia. But that, that's the way civilization goes, really, isn't it? And Gandhi nukes. Uh, I, I might Gandhi. I made sure Gandhi is not in this game. <laughs> Yeah, I went off and I, yeah, I selected random for most of them, but I made sure that Gandhi wasn't one of them. Because, yeah, I do not trust Gandhi from even Civ 3, I don't trust him. <laughs> no, they made sure that Gandhi is still as aggressive with his <laughs> nuclear weapons really as is. he always has been. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, so, so, far I'm in, so far I'm enjoying it and it looks like they've done good things with it. Excellent. Commander Shan. 
I have had a great week so far. Namely because today is my birthday. Oh. And Happy birthday. And my birthday present from Mrs. Shan arrives next Wednesday. Ah. Is your birthday present to Tesla? Yes. <laughs> is, is it the one that's got the RCS thrusters on it? It's got the full docking computer and everything on it. Have you played I don't have you that game yet? Sorry? Yeah, Ben's having issues there. Am I back? Am I back? Yes. Ah, have you yeah. have you actually have you played the SpaceX uh, ISS docking simulator yet? I haven't even sat in it yet, to be honest. So. Oh, that, oh, that's a lot of fun, that. So I should be playing with it next week, mm -hmm. no doubt. Believe it or not, I've actually done it to save money. Okay. Because it will save us. Uh, a hundred and eighty-three pounds a month. Oh, is that in the in the tax? Tax and petrol and stuff like that. So yeah, it's it's a cost-saving exercise. Well, that's what I told Mister Shan anyway. But yeah, it, it does actually it, it does actually save money. Actually, it's quite remarkable how much money you spend on petrol. What well, if you if you look at tells you the cost of ownership proposition. Cars are really expensive to run. Yes, they are. The price. But I, I, I'm looking to the uh, three seconds, not to sixty, and eight seconds, not to a hundred stuff to scare scare mums and dads. So that does actually, yeah, that, that that is frightening with you behind the wheel. Oh God, this horrible feeling of of sort of Carmageddon. Well, I've been, I've been um, playing Grand Theft Auto to get in practice. <laughs> right, everybody else, stay away from where Shan lives if you want to live. It'll be Death Race 2000 all over again. No, it's not that bad. But it's got something called Chill Mode, which Mrs. <laughs> Shan insists on using. And it's like, no, you don't, don't use Chill Mode. It's not the point. But yeah, she's saying, I don't want to go that fast. <laughs> so we, sh we shall see. I'll pick it up Wednesday anyway, next Wednesday. Um, well, I hope it, we'll get a full report on it. Yes, because I should be in jail after <laughs> sitting <laughs> in it. <laughs> Live <sighs> inside Wormwood Scrubs. In the channel. Can you stream from it? What, the Tesla? Yeah, I just wondering, you know, we can get a, a Shan doing a live stream from your 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 birthday present, and and then <laughs> we'll pick you up, and that that'll be awesome. Well, I I am thinking of setting a GoPro up, pointing towards a passenger seat, so I can record um, when I take my mum out in it, <laughs> and it, and it's got it's got some great features because it's got the the summon mode, you know, where the car drives itself to wherever you are. So um, I've got a whole series of pranks all lined up with it. Um, so things like saying, I'll oh, just stay there, Mum. I just need to go and check something at the front. And so I'll jump out, and then I'll drive the car into the garage with her still in it and no driver and that sort of thing. Just bear in mind, folks, that this is what Shan does to his own mother. God knows what he's going to do to you lot in a virtual reality game. I love my mum. <laughs> you love scary, eh? Huh? Yeah, but everyone does that, surely. No. <laughs> and don't call me Shirley. Uh, oh. I, said, I, I need a kit voice pack. I don't think they do a voice pack actually on them, but it would be what you can do in the late in the new when the newer software releases. Apparently, um, the Euro our, our European overlords have decreed that. Um, Electric cars are going to have to have a little a sound that comes out of them, a pedestrian sound, when they traverse and go forward. So yes. to, to get cars to uh, you know not run people over. So it's more mm -hmm. sports. But anyway, so apparently what you're going to be able to do is upload your own sounds into Tesla. 
<laughs> so you can have your own sound when it plays out loud when it's moving. So, so you um, can record it's... yourself going brum, 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 brum. I was going to do the crazy frog. Guy. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, just oh, imagine yeah. the whole load of people around London driving those with loads of money coming out of it. There's an 80s reference for you. <laughs> I'm actually quite pleased with it because it's one of their, it's one of their inventory ones. So it's one of their cars that have been um, you know, imported, but the person cancelled the order. So I, I got quite a lot of money off it. So I'm quite pleased about it, really. Um, and plus, That's I can get good. next Wednesday rather than next year. So, so basically, I've got. The um, full self drive package, I got that for free, effectively, and other stuff as well came added on as part of a sweetener for the deal. So, yeah, looking forward to it. Yeah, we're looking forward to hear about it. Just the, the shenanigans. <laughs> we want a full report on shenanigans, I think. I'm going to be lucky to Freaky. get a pack of Smarties for my wife for my birthday. <laughs> Well, I say it was it's saving money. Remember, Cal, it's time. Times are tight, so you have to save whatever money you can <laughs> by and buying that, a Tesla. <laughs> well, to be honest, the the, the money you save on it, it it makes it cheaper than my current mm. car. You know, it's a car, I did the math, and for for months and months and months, it had been kind of on a knife edge of whether it is cheaper to have the electric car or cheaper to have my current car. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, and then the maths have sort of shifted because of these inventory cards now coming up, um, and interest rate drops and stuff like that. So yeah, it's it's it, it's saves fortune. Wow. Well, um, moving on from um, futuristic cars. Um, hello, Commander Chig. How are you? I'm doing well. I really <laughs> think it's all Shan. Lucky me. Yeah, you get to follow. Birthday, yeah, you get to follow Birthday Boy with his Tesla. Um, yeah, I don't know how I can top that. I, yeah. It's been good. It's been hectic, you know. All of a sudden, being thrust into community manager over at Loose Screws and co-host and all the shenanigans and fun going on over there. It's been a a busy week, week and a half, you know. So you know, bourbon, uh, cheese, and flying my spaceship keep me going. Excellent. Um, anything particular you've been doing with the spaceship? Oh, we've gotten into BGS quite a bit. We've been playing with that. I got into the beta basically just long enough to give a bunch of people credits who needed it. And <laughs> uh, other than that, I, I CQC. I'm always CQCing it. Oh no, there's there's a there's a good um, <laughs> there's a good improvement that's happened in the game lately. Uh, let's see what's been happening with myself for the last couple of weeks. Well, um, I made a mistake, a bit like Ben, only my game of choice was this thing called Star Wars Rebellion, where you end up either fighting for the side of the Empire or the side, fighting for the side of the Alliance, and it's it's basically a, a, a strategy game very similar to, to Civ, where you have to win the war. The, um, it's the it's an RTS one, isn't it? It's, it isn't, it isn't. It, it you can set the speed as it runs. It's not turn based, but it is. Yeah, I suppose it's RTS or R uh, real time strategic. To be honest, um, because the the actual big fleet to fleet battles and stuff that that they the um, they push for this aren't all that good. But the actual strategy game is, and it was one of these things where I got woken up at silly club. Well. Someone came downstairs at silly o'clock in the morning and said, are you still playing that game? And when you suddenly look outside and you realise it's beginning to get light again, uh, you, you think, oh, I haven't done that in too many years. So uh, I've basically had to put that one on the back burner uh, because I started playing a game on last Wednesday and I'm already up to 24 hours. So... Uh... <laughs> Yeah, so because of that, I haven't been doing that much in game. Um, I do know my alt commander has been helping out the emperor. Uh, the uh, the emperor's faction managed to get an expansion going in power play, which was was good. And at present, it was running at about two hundred and twenty five percent for uh, actually expanding into this new system. 
However, it was expanding into a uh, federal system and all the federal power play factions banded together and they have managed to block it with an amazing 3,800 cent to block. <laughs> so we ain't getting that system next week. <laughs> I thought we were doing quite well at 250%. Obviously not good enough. Um, and of course, my main is mining in Boran. And it turns out I was mining wrong. <laughs> I've now learned how to mine properly in there. So, uh, yeah, I'm now beginning to, to rake in the cash in preparation. Right. So, moving on from there. <laughs> we haven't had a bathroom update. Do, do we seriously need yeah, a bathroom update? There, there isn't one yet. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to put tiles on a wall when the tiling guy's uh, socially distanced and shielded. So <laughs> we'll, have to, we'll come back to that once we're out this side and things are a little bit more normal and there's actually people that can come into the house to actually do it. But for now, we can't. So, yeah, it's still there. The sink still runs. It doesn't leak. There's no plumbing issues. So, so far, so good from that test. Um... But other than that, yeah, we've just got to wait until we can get back to some normality and then uh, let's uh, get it done. As um, mm. could, you, could you not put some tiles looking wallpaper up with blue tack or something to make it look it's actually It looks not bad because, I mean, it is, it's basically tanked, so you've got a lovely blue vinyl effect up the walls. Oh, Doesn't, right. Yeah, so you can have a shower, but we haven't put the, the shower, shower equipment in yet. Uh, and, uh, still, it's functional, so... Yeah, it's more functional than it was. So toilet's in, and the sink's in, and those are working great. Um, it's just a case of, yeah, getting the rest done when we can. Um, so far, I mean, it, it, rather than a bathroom update, uh, it's a, a Moof Health update. He's been in the hospital mm. getting his blood test to make sure that he's not liquefying organs. So we'll find out, hopefully, by the end of this week, whether or not his new meds are safe and working they've made a big difference to him but it's just to make sure that the side effects are all kept in check so that's yes. the, that's where we are at the so minute so how's he been has he been concerned with catching something at the hospital or is it a oh. matter of i have to go to hospital because well he had to go because unfortunately the risk is that if his medication and his blood's not monitored that he could have serious impacts on very vital organs in his body, which this medication can trigger. Um, so he has to get them. So he was really concerned because he's hyper aware that he is on immune suppressants and therefore um, to catch COVID would be the best part of a guaranteed death um, for him. It's, uh, you know... It's it's like he, if he gets a bad flu, it's equally as potentially mm -hmm. disastrous for him. So he was, for want of a better word, shitting himself. Um, but he went, yeah. you know, he went in and he's got nothing but compliments for the health service who had him come in a particular way, was greeted by a nurse, was led right through, had the procedure, wasn't waiting and barely saw another person. Yeah. So, yep, they, they did brilliantly. So, um, again, a sign that, you know, all the work that, that everyone did uh, observing the lockdown and staying at home and helping not overwhelm the NHS allows for those kind of procedures to be done extremely safely. So I suppose we, you know, again, it's a good point to just thank everyone for their diligence and doing what they can because this is the side effects. There's other kinds of stories out there that are far more tragic, but, you know, we... Hopefully we'll be through having this discussion in five, six months when it's all a, a kind of secondary Horrible thing. Memory. Yeah, a, a rather distinct joke that we all make about, do you remember 2020? No, neither do I. Um, <laughs> at the risk of sounding political, at least Scotland's still telling people to stay at home rather than, well, do what you kind of want, but you know, don't be a dick. Yeah. It's Which I can understand where they're coming from. Go it's different. Work, they, I don't mean, go to work. The, oh, yeah, <laughs> the thing is that the the you know as as you'll find in in the likes of Wales and Ireland and such, the rural areas are a lot safer, but the core areas are more 
likely for it. So um, the difference is that the you know sort of England and the R number, that key R number, are different in these different areas, and therefore it all makes sense for there to be slightly different approaches. Um, See, I'm not sure about that because. You know, I, I do actually agree with the government and they're saying the lockdown shouldn't be regional because let's say, for example, they say, OK, great, London, open for business. The R number's down to 0.3. People who live in, I don't know, the Midlands, great, we can go to London now. And they, well, what they'll do is they'll increase the infection levels because that's exactly what happened in is, Italy. Is, is that when they shut argument? down Lombardy, everyone... Is that an argument for... Regionalise or against? Because under it's a regionalised argument, argument would be that the people in the Midlands may have a higher R number and therefore may be subject to a tighter control. Not allowed to visit places with a lower R rate. Yeah, but how do you, how do you know? Because what happened in Lombardia in Italy, which I think is the example they're taking, is that they shut Lombardia down in Italy and everyone else sort of said, oh, OK, well... I'll quickly scoot to uh, southern Italy, and they brought it all in there as well, and we saw the effect. So uh, the best bet is to bring it down everywhere, I think. So then, you know, obviously if you're in a low area, it's a bit annoying, but it's just safer. You just can't take any chances at all, really, not with people's lives. And can I you think imagine... I've the car, Shan, by the way. <laughs> oh, yeah? Yeah. If you have a look at the stream, I think, of... I, I think I found your car. <laughs> so yeah, I mean it's it's difficult, but I think you know that you know you do have to. Obviously, we are different nations under the same banner, and uh, you have to try and balance. It's not it's an impossible act for anyone in leadership uh, because well, that's right. And it's you know, so I've yeah, got great um, sympathies, and and all I will say is the support that's there is life saving. I hope this has brought a sea change in our society, personally. I I kind of hope it's highlighted the effort and sacrifice of group of groups of workers and people who were previously completely ignored and taken for granted. So I'm not talking about the doctors and nurses. I'm talking about the delivery guys, the postmen, mm. binmen, all people like that who, you know, because if you don't have binmen, if they decided no, too dangerous, I'm not going out. Uh, we'd be well, we'd be overrun with rats in at least a couple of weeks. So, oh, crikey, are you kidding? In Glasgow, the first thing to stop was the the bin, the bins. So we went from having the sort of the recycle centre shut, uh, but it was down to staffing levels at that point. So the staff levels dropped drastically. So they suspended all recycling. Um, so you then got your black bin done every week. And then just this beginning of this month, they've now well, this is sort of the south side of Glasgow, so East End. Glasgow, I believe, is fine, but we um, hit a real problem. My house is full of cardboard. Uh, I am essentially <coughs> living in a powder keg. Uh, one sparking fart, and the next thing you know, we're going to be up in flames in this house. But it's trying to maintain your... Yeah, it is difficult, but we, yeah, you appreciate them more because you realise that that's um, a service that you take for granted. I totally agree with you. Uh, and the other one is, of course, you've got checkout operator staff. You've got the, and they're traditionally um, your kind of older women, um, and that's not mm -hmm. being unfair. But you know, generally, that's what you've got is um, women that are now starting to earn their own money because they stayed at home to raise kids and things, and that's terribly. Yeah. Anyway, um, that's not been my experience with the people down here. But yeah. Anyway, Chig, what, how are you finding things happening in America? We are pretty much the same as you guys. It's been funny talking to friends in, you know, England and stuff is we've pretty much followed suit with you and vice versa. You know, one tightens restrictions, the other one tightens and one loosens, the other one loosens. And it is definitely loosening up over here. And I don't know if it should or shouldn't, but I, you know, living in the middle of the country, I don't know a single person who's had it. Uh, who's obviously, if I don't know anybody who's had it, I don't know anybody who's died from it. Mm. So it is, it is what it is, you know, we're just, it doesn't seem real. And yeah. the, well, the thing about it is, it doesn't seem to be a right answer. It doesn't matter what government does anything. It's always the wrong thing in hindsight. You just have to, you just have to make a decision and hope you got it right. So I, all this armchair quarterbacking or whatever like that that's going on in the media 
just drives me up the wall because it doesn't matter what someone chooses, it's going to be wrong at some point. It'll always be second guessed. You can't win. Yeah. Um, as you can probably tell by the fact that this discussion has gone on for so long, um, it's quite rather light on news in the in the wonderful world of Elite Dangerous at the moment. Um, the we had uh, Bruce and Stephen in a uh, in a lockdown live stream, um, which happened on last Thursday. Uh, there was no new information; just the the usual stuff about. Um, uh, how things are going with the beta? Um, anybody want to give them a give a progress report on the beta so far? I mean, I know I haven't. Today is the first day I've actually gone into the beta. Uh, so apart from getting used to the new interface, that's been my experience. I think well, a lot of people will be looking forward to the one million credit carriers in a week. Or so. Yeah. I, I know. I am. I'm waiting to do a top shift when I get hold of a uh, one of the carriers, just to see whether or not we mine. break the surface. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll sell you. I'll sell you mine for fifteen billion credits. Fifteen billion credits. Okay. Uh -huh. And if and I'm mine... careful, owner. <laughs> Does that include the Tesla? <laughs> no. And all the struggles. I'm not going to live this down now. I'd, I, I'd, I'd wish I'd never said anything about my birthday present now because you lot just keep ridding hey, me now. Your other car was very nice too, though, Shan. So jealousy does sound like mockery, but it's not. It is just, you know, that's an awesome car. And actually, yeah, I can't wait to see how it works I, out for you. I'm, I'm looking forward. Yeah, I'm looking forward to you scaring the bejesus out of me at LifeCon. Oh no! He you, you wants you to do donuts in the in the car park. Oh no! I want him to accelerate to 100 miles an hour in 10 yards, and and go straight through the railway station. The problem, <laughs> yeah, where I have to be, I do have to, have to be a bit careful with parents though, because uh, Mrs. Shan's mum is quite elderly and has a heart condition, so <laughs> I have to be really careful. That's my Tesla. Well, the thing was, though, <laughs> if the worst did happen, they, I could be, I could be accused of doing it for the money, you know. And I don't want that to happen, so she's going to get a very gentle ride because I don't want mm -hmm. her to go. <laughs> yeah, we don't, we don't want any um, suspicious deaths uh, on on people's conscience. No. What, I, what the other thing I want to do is, I want, when I drive down the motorway, I'm going to wave double-handed at people as they drive past me. <laughs> and then put, put one of our dogs in the driver's seat and drive it around the car park with the dog looking at us driving. That'd be funny as well. You've seen the the videos of people using their Teslas to drive up to the McDonald's di drive through, yeah? Uh, yeah. Just, just, just for context, right? Because I've got a, a relatively new Mini, and it has the automatic reverse parking system. Um. And I don't know, Shan, what your experience of self-drive is at the moment, but you're going to need heart medication for yourself until you <laughs> get used to it. It is the most well, terrifying on, concept. Well, I I have it on my, my current car, um, and I've used it once, bottled out halfway into the car parking space and did it myself. <laughs> um Parallel parking, Mr. Shan's done it with parallel parking, because that's just going to the beat, press a button, and it does it, and that's fine. But it, with, with our current car, it's, it's very nervous. It goes back and forward and back and forward, and it takes twice as long as what it does to back it in yourself. And a driver can get awfully impatient waiting for the car to shuffle forward and back. So I don't, I don't use it for that, because it's quicker just to reverse the car in. So it's kind of like a docking computer. Got it. <laughs> yeah, kind of. Yeah, I mean the, but for the Tesla, the European Union have nerfed the automatic driving quite a bit uh, for mm -hmm. the rules in the US, um, like the summon feature. Uh, in the US, I assume you can you... just patch it in. Oh yeah, well, in, in in the US, it will drive across a car park, avoiding all the other cars, and come right to you. It'll so you can say come here and it'll go across the car park and do it in the because of the EU rules you, you almost have to be within 
20 feet of it. Wow. <laughs> it does sound quite astounding. Next week, uh, we're going to be reporting on Shan having run himself over in a car park. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's one of the things I want to try with my brother, because I want to get my brother standing in front of the car and summon it to see if it'll run him. <laughs> wow. <laughs> On the, on this officer, it was just an experiment that went wrong. We were all tragically upset. Have you got his insurance details to hand, just in case? My brother, why would I, why would I want them? <laughs> I mean, in case he dents the car. No, no, he won't. He's, he's quite <laughs> he's quite fat. He'll just bounce off. He'll just bounce. Okay. <laughs> so, um. I mean, there there hasn't been much in the way of um, updates or anything like that. It's it's just been basically the uh, the progress with the beta. Um, well, the Colin, sorry, there was some clarity from a couple of dev posts um, with some questions. I believe Yamex asked, um, and the questions I've, I I I can't say them like Yamex. So I'll say them without swearing. Um, in that, the couple of questions is okay. Why do we have to to have buy all the modules in a in a batch. Why can't we just buy mm -hmm. the modules you want and store them up? That was one of the questions. And the other question was, um, why are we having to pay uh, ship repair costs for jumping and things like that? So, you, did Sh so, Shan vanish for everyone, or was it just me? Mark, I'm still here. Can you hear me? Did I? Back yeah, we, we can. Out? We can hear you. So it's fine. Okay. okay. Well, anyway, the, the answer to the um, why we have to buy modules in mods was it's almost like, and this is being some mind, but you know nowadays everything you buy you have to buy in a pack. You can't buy individual yeah. stuff. And the idea is it makes the, it makes it simpler for commanders to manage. You just buy the lot, and you've got everything you need. You don't need to then worry about running out of stock of an item you can just buy, buy a bit of everything so that was the answer they gave for that the jump yeah that's the, bullshit yeah and the the, the um jump repair costs and things like that and that was basically um well every other ship in the game has um maintenance costs and paint costs and repair yeah. costs when they move so carriers are bigger so therefore their repair bills should be bigger which, I, I, I can't understand that. Uh, a lot of people forget about the internal repair that you sometimes have to do, the, the ship integrity, mm -hmm. uh, because if you don't keep the ship integrity up to scratch, then um, you're something like 30% weaker than you would have been, and you don't realise it. Well, it's not just that. Do you remember a couple of years ago we went through, we had the crawl and punishment interview mm -hmm. with Sandro, yeah, and he talked about the ubiquity rating. Do you remember that? Yeah, you know, is that, that, uh, yeah. Go on. Now, what that is is the scruffier looking and more in disrepair your ship, the more the authorities take notice of it and think, "Hang on a minute, this is a bit of a shifty character." So you do end up being scanned more and things like that because your lack of maintenance. I thought that was those certain ships that just do not get scanned. Yes, there are. Or get scanned less anyway. Yeah. One of which is the ASP Scout, which I do believe is its only positive. Well, I guess has to be some reason for having it. <laughs> That's one way of looking at it. Um... So, I mean, going back to the beta just quickly, I mean, is it working out for everybody? I and mean, has anybody got anything that they want to highlight about it? The stuff I've done in it all works. I'm getting used to the changes in men menus. Mm -hmm. I want to try the CQC stuff properly. Mm. Um, so, if we, you know, if we if we could all jump into some CQC. And try that; it would be interesting, maybe. Um, although I need to come out of playing, I need to come out of playing with the Dragon Simulator. <laughs> uh, 
Oh, I'm currently enjoying flying around the ISS. Now, there's something I wish they'd put in the game as a historical artifact. Mind you, by mm-hmm. then, it's probably a burnt up in the atmosphere. I'm sure it could be moved. So, um, well, it, that, that's really about all the uh, information that we've got. I mean, uh, there, there's not been much going on. So, what do you guys reckon? We'll take an advert break and then come back with a bit of a discussion about maybe Thargoids and space legs. Yeah, well, I was going to say, actually, uh, well, talking about beta, um, one of the good things to do in beta is practice your Thargoid combat because Mm -hmm. it's consequence-free blowing up. You know, you don't lose in-game money or anything like that, so you can try as many silly builds and tactics as you like and practice. So that's a good use for beta. Yeah, that that is a, a very good point. Except for the slight problem, it seems that uh, there is a bug in the beta at the moment where the anti, which the anti Xeno initiative have reported, um, the uh, the Thargoid um, USSs are not populated by anything. Oops. So you 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 drop into um, uh, a Thargoid um, USS and. There's nothing there, and they've highlighted. I must admit this. Um, they've highlighted it on the forums, and there does seem to be a lot of um, concern about this because obviously a bug that happens in the beta normally, unless it's high priority, ends up going live. And obviously the anti Xeno initiative are concerned because they've lost the um, the conflict zones. They've lost. Um, a lot of their their gameplay and all they've got is what's around uh, the Pleiades and the Witch Head. And if that's gone as well, well, there's a lot of people wondering whether or not that's it for the anti Zeno initiative for the moment. Hmm. Yeah, little they're biggest, a little bit concerned. Biggest thing I've uh, gathered from Beta is just how easy it is to exchange credits now. So people that are rich can give their poor friends credits super easy it's a little tedious but easy you don't have to go dropping ltds or anything anymore you can just uh buy and sell stuff from each other well that's right there was a quite a significant bug wasn't there did you remember seeing that on the, oh um... was this the the wing bug where people could just constantly um give that you a wing mix else. free money yeah that well, was something else. an exploit. Well, not an exploit. It was a bug. But yeah, if, if that was in live game, I think they'd end up calling it an exploit because people are making like ridiculous amount of credits, yeah. like five Four billion point. an hour or something. That's right. Yeah, for every wing member would get five billion an hour. Wow. Yeah. Um, what was the, the exploit you were on about, um, or the bug you were on about, Shan? So that, that same was one. the one, yeah. Ah, right. Yeah, um, there are also concerns about the fact that um, a lot of people are saying that, that there's a possibility that this can call, upset the balance in both the, the BGS and power play uh, with people hoarding various items on the ships and then just dumping them all in one big go. Has anybody seen any concern about that? I think diminishing returns would kind of negate that to a point, and they could always dial that, you know, in one direction or the other anyway. So I'm not sure how big of an issue that'll be. Mm. Uh, there was a, 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 I know that there was complaints in Power Play where people were saying that um, a lot of players would load up on one ship, they'd jump in this fleet of vouchers on one system, thus making it completely impossible for it to be blocked or or um uh, prepared and things like that which um i think we'll need look looking at uh but there was one positive now i can't remember which stream they've said this but they have mentioned that once fleet carriers is out the way they are looking at the return of galnet news and possibly community goals Interesting. So, will there be a? Do we know if there's going to be a lead up to these 
CGs, or is it just going to be news flash and then straight to CG? Well, I mean, it, if you want to speculate about it, it could be that, that um, they're planning out community goals and and uh, CQC, uh, sorry, CQC and Galnet News stuff um, in preparation for the big New Year update. I mean, that would be quite nice for a few interstellar initiatives to build up. For sure, the game needs it. We need a lot more uh, content to occupy our time. Hmm. Right. Well, if that's the, if everybody's happy with um, with talking about the beta for the moment, um, could we have a ad break and then we'll come back with a little bit of a discussion about the last speculative bit of the New Year update. Have you been missold PPI? Python Protection Insurance was missold if you didn't want it, ask for it, or need it. I was missold Python Protection Insurance and I got a claim worth 3,000 credits. At Cowell & McGrath, we are ready to pursue claims for pilots who were sold PPI, even though they didn't have an escape pod. When my partnership was destroyed, the insurance became invalid. I settled out of court for enough credits to restart my narcotics and weapons shipping business. Millions have been missold Python Protection Insurance they can never claim, simply because they don't have an escape pod. Why should you pay for not reading the small print? My husband was missold PPI. As a result of our claim, we now own Jupiter. Carolyn McGrath, turning your carelessness into profitable lawsuits. We buy any ship, bar none. We buy any ship, bar none. Any model, any colour, any shape, any size. We buy any ship, bar none. We here at We Buy Any Ship, bar none, are ready to take your excess space travel vehicles off your hands. No more negotiating with dodgy space station vendors. We'll simply give you an estimated quote online. Then, when you get here, we'll point out all the little dints and scratches that make the price get smaller and smaller before we actually give you any money. And the beauty is, we take any ship. We buy any ship. Bar none. Terms and conditions apply. We buy any ship excludes trading in any of the following vehicles. Adder, Anaconda, Asp, Bauer, Cobra, Constrictor, Cruisers, Eagle, Falcon, Gecko, Griffin, Gear, Harris, Harrier, Hawk, Kestrel, Crate, Lanners, Lifters, Lions, Mantis, Merlin, Moray, Osprey, Panther, Puma, Python, Saker, Sidewinder, Skeet, Spar, Stowmaster, Tearsel, Tiger, Transporter, Turner, Viper, Wyvern, or any Imperial or Thargoid vessels. Eddie Lee Wise here. Our family-run business looks after all your sartorial needs. Whether you need something to turn your pink python purple, or you want to wrap your buns up in a nice tight flight suit, Millsburn Ken can sort you right out. He's an expert at inside leg, and my wife Barb's is a whiz with a sewing machine. Bespoke tarting for you and your ship. Visit Eddie and Sons, plus my daughters, at Lave Station. Right, sir. Cough, please. <coughs> and welcome back. Um, now, um, one of the things that uh, was highlighted in this leak that um, has proven um, very accurate so far was that they highlighted uh, first-person shooter mechanics in a um, uh, against the Thargoids, which I was speculating how the heck that's going to work. Now, there has been um, leaked artwork or concept work that we've seen before of what the Thargoids look like. Um, so, now the main thing that I was wondering is, is it going to be a case of us invading the, the Thargoid bases and exploring about on foot? Or do you think our Clear bases, if we build them, will come under Thargoid attack. Who would like to start? I can dive in, and I want to say both. Uh, or at least I hope both. Um, I like the idea, let's say, sake of argument, you're optimistic enough to go and build a player base in the Pleiades. <laughs> then you have the potential of some residents taking offence to that um, and possibly doing grand assault on your stuff. Um, I mean, this is where it comes into how is it going to be managed um, 
including the whole multi-platform, multi, multi everything side of it. Yeah. Um, you know, you can even if you're playing when all this goes down, there's no guarantee you're actually going to be in the instant when True. they attack you. Um, but I, I, I do, I genuinely hope this all happens in open world rather than some weird instanced off area of, oh my god, your base is under Thargoid attack! And you suddenly load into another server and anyone who's on defense is doing that and anyone who's on offense is doing that. I, I, I desperately hope we don't get something like that. Um, and that obviously goes if Thargoids are attacking you too. Um, I want everything to be in the one universe. Okay, I'm a little bit confused about that. I mean, do you mean by the one universe, do you mean open only or um, uh, okay, only so people in a private group? If I had my way, and I'm not going to, so you know, I have to accept that. If <laughs> I had my way, there wouldn't be multiple instances. There wouldn't be, you know, it would be hundred people all in an instance and we wouldn't be worrying about it. But that's not the reality we live in. Uh, and we would you know, we wouldn't be struggling with getting five people trying to find each other all on a planetary base and things like that. Um, right, I see where you're getting at now, yeah. So yeah, if I ha so if I had my way, you, me, Shan and everyone like that, we could all go off and say we're gonna defend Colin's base and Chig and Ty. Oh, no, no. Why would I want to defend Colin's base? Well, you can. You have, okay, you, you do, you, do you want to be a dirty I want to be traitor a and side. work with yeah, the I Americans? Want to, I, well, I, no, I want to. I want to <laughs> be a fish columnist <laughs> and, and take down Colin's shields in his base. Okay, well, fine. You else. can work with Chig and Ty and Trax and be a traitorous bar steward and attack Colin's base as well. But I would like it all to be. There and we don't need to worry about it, but yeah, you know, that's not reality, unfortunately. I must admit, it does remind Shan does remind me of the kind of player in a Dungeons and Dragons party that GMs absolutely hate. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely the kind of person who you, if Shan's in your group, you don't bother writing a scenario; you just make it up as you go along. <laughs> um. Well. Uh, Episode title, Get It Shan on His Birthday. <laughs> Episode title, Shan Expects Us to Be Nice to Him Because It's His Birthday. It's supposed to buy me Get a beer or something. <laughs> oh, oh we'll buy you a beer, but unfortunately, you, you can't Birmingham, email it. I'll, I'll, if you come to Birmingham, I will pour you out a glass of rum. Actually, I'll pour you out a glass of my good whiskey, and I'll leave it on my doorstep. Well, after licking the sides of it first, I thought. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll make sure it's, it's sterile first. I didn't say how I was going to make sure it's sterile, but I'll make sure it's sterile. Oh, uh, okay. This is taking a, 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 a weird tangent. Um... Always does. Always does. <laughs> I, as, far as, as far as the first-person side of it, I'd prefer it more if the Thargoids attack and board our ships, then multi-crew would get interesting. You'd have somebody like, hey, take the wheel, I'm, or take the stick, I'm going to go take care of these Thargoids, and in the larger ships, we know there's so much room to run around. That might be more interesting to me than running around on bases and, and fleet carriers, because of the persistence side of it that you have to worry about. They can hit you when you're not in-game, which just seems odd to me. Wow. I mean, imagine if we then have to actually, in the big ships, we have to hire crew or marines in order to defend your ship opens a whole new avenue of gameplay i guess could be fun yeah. so would that then allow me to say say colin or ben they uh -huh. hire a crew yes and and i then offer, give them an offer they can't refuse to come and work for me i like that idea also i that adds a whole other element yeah, didn't they actually? They played around with this um, concept of loyalty in in the DDF, where if you hire wingmen, dependent on your um, 
status with the the faction that you hired them from would depend on whether or not they'd be loyal. So if <laughs> I do I do like the fact that sort of they they were taking into account that um if you were if you were attacking civilians uh and the the there would be a loyalty check for your wingmen whether or not they carry on attacking with you or whether or not they'd actually attack you instead. Man, that is a whole nother level of depth this game and I I think it needs it. You know, everybody talks about it being, you know, a billion light years wide and an inch deep. You start adding more and more stuff like that, you just have more gameplay. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I don't, you know, I have never, I never considered boarding actions by Thargoids before. I mean, that's a, that's a, an interesting thought. Um, and if you, if, um, they were, oh, what's the name of the film that they were, they were using as an example for this? Well, the Alien. So you have like a cat. You run no, Starship yeah. Troopers. No, Starship Troopers. Starship Troopers, that was it. It was on the tip of my tongue, but I couldn't remember it. Sort of very bloody with body parts going everywhere. But <laughs> my you, like you saw was more? Alien, really. Do you want to know more? Yes. <laughs> I mean, that that sounds to me like it, it, it'd be... Um, well... <sighs> difficult to manage. A couple it's, parts of that. The A, you know, we don't have artificial gravity, so we'd be floating in our ships fighting them. That's the first thing they'd have to, you know, take care of. Some hand mm -hmm. wave them, and all of a sudden we have artificial gravity, and you take care of that. But yeah, I just, I don't know what they would do. We just got to wait and see. Uh, you tell me. I mean, at the danger of pulling this into Star Citizen territory, they do have, I mean, okay, so Star Citizen, they've got mag boots or something like that. Um, you you've got something whereby you get within a certain distance of of the of the platform or your ship, and you'll mag boot onto onto the thing and potentially break your legs in the process if you're coming in too fast. Um, what I would want, sorry, you, when you said mag boot, I just thought of yeah. a brilliant weapon you could have for people with mag boots on. Mm. A bin bag trash. Bag of tin cans, then they just like, whoosh, like surround you in scrap metal. Oh, I think the whole idea of mag boots is you turn them off and on again, and you can dial the strength of them and things like that. It'd be funny though, wouldn't it? It would be funny, but then it'd be like, oh, somebody's throwing a pile of can tin cans at me. Let me just turn my magnetic boots yeah, off. Yeah, but if, if you've got if you're covered in tin cans and stuff like that, you couldn't reach to turn it off, could you? Well, no, because it's just you just use feet controls for doing it. You know, tap your heels together three times. Oh, like like in Dorothy, you, you are space Dorothy. Uh, oh, no, I'm actually I'm actually thinking the way they do it in the Expanse because that just makes sense. That's what I thought of for sure. Yeah. Yeah, and they've in in the Expanse they do have you've got st the strength of the magnetic boots, and yeah, you know, obviously you can just turn it off as well. Um, so I don't see why you couldn't have similar in in Elite, and it's a sensible way to do it. Um, like Karamba in chat has kind of an Iron Man way of doing it in mind with thrusters on your hands. There's a whole I, other idea. Well, I would like I I actually think that that would work very well, and that's what they've got it in Star Citizen. Everyone's suit is essentially it's like a little EVA pack as well as a suit. So you can jump off the ship and do an EVA over to someone else's ship. Um, I think it is all basically FA off, but I might be wrong. Uh, it's all. It feels very natural to me for you when I've used it anyway. Um, and it's, it's really interesting just running to the edge of the pad and then just walking off and all of a sudden you're floating away there. It's it's definitely they definitely have a lot of ideas. It's all a matter yeah. of how they decide to do it. I, I I'm excited. I wish that we would start getting some information. Hopefully, you know, sometime you know 
shortly after Fleet Carriers, we start seeing some teaser trailers or at least, you know, a tiny bit of information. Here's a, here's a thought. It's a slightly tangential, but it's mm-hmm. on the FPS kind of thing. Who has oh, seen the Unreal 5 en- uh, engine demo? Oh, not yet. Triangles. <laughs> Because okay. I was I was I was looking at that and I was thinking if if that's the level of detail that players are expecting now, will the Cobra engine be sufficiently detailed enough not to look archaic next to things like the Unreal Engine Five or even the Doom Five, even in the Doom Eternal engine? You know that's. That's pretty slick, and I'm just, I just don't really want to have a uh, an FPS where the characters look like they've been alien abducted from Planet Coaster, or like they were extras in this week's blacklist. Karamba's <laughs> just saying, actually, if you look at your pilots uh, when they flex the stick hand, you'll see wee thrusters. I can't see wee thrusters on the palm of the hands. But I can see what looks like wee thrusters in my fingers. Thrusters in your fingers, as in. It looks thrust- like I've got. It looks like I've got. I've got in my fingers on my glove. I've got yeah. like these little blue glowy pads in the finger of my glove. See, I um, thought they were because you, you know how you can get gloves that work with touch screens. Well, I was. That's what I was thinking. Because I, I don't think that like Spider-Man gloves, you know, like sucked the. St- yeah. Um, I was if, they were propulsion, the if they were propulsion thrusters on your fingers, essentially what would happen is the minute you tried to move, all your fingers would snap off. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Everybody's saying, watching Iron Man too much. Yeah. Karamba's saying he's seen something in your palm of your hand, but that could just be hairs. <laughs> Loop. Oh, just. Um, oh, no. And, and I'm assuming you've all seen the thrusters on the back of your seat. Maybe that's what they are. They're lube dispensers. Sorry, I'm not going quite oh. Oh, no. oh, Grant. Leech suppositories. <laughs> yes. And lubium. Sorry. Yep. <laughs> oh, God. We're up to the sloppy, poppy stuff already. I'm, I'm actually looking at the... Yeah. So you've got RCS thrusters now. on your... You've, got, you've definitely got RCS thrusters on your seat. Yeah. Um, but I don't see why we couldn't have that somewhere in our spacesuit or whatever it is as well. Fozza is still repeating the same point, but can someone tell me how I can play a FPS with a hot ass? Fozza, are you not familiar with the multiple control mechanisms that Frontier have put into this game, where you can use your flight stick for flying in your hot ass, for flying your ship, you can use a, a gamepad for controlling your SRV or a steering wheel system, and you can have it all set up independently, which means that when it came to the FPS, you could use a gamepad or your mouse and keyboard, whatever suited. So, I mean, I think it will just be a case of they're going to encourage us now more than ever to use those multiple options uh, in order to jump modes. Uh, and if you only play with a hot ass only, that's your problem, mate. That's your problem. Your problem. Let, let's face it, though, Grant. Foz is also still asking, which way does the station rotate and how do I know where the front door is? <laughs> yeah, but... I, I, was is... Actually just thinking about, I, I was actually just thinking about that, the different control methods when you're going through it. That Can you imagine you're in VR and you know exactly where your hotas is and then you suddenly have to reach for your mouse or controller because you've been pulled yeah. into FPS. And you can just imagine the amount of coffee and drink that's going to be spilled over keyboards <laughs> and desks and everything when you try and find it in VR. If, <laughs> if you're in the old VR systems, then yeah, that definitely would be a thing. But now, I don't know. I mean, uh, if using the pass-through camera or the sort of line um, border camera in the new um, Vive... Uh, what is it now? The Vive Cosmos... Um, you can practically make out the letters on your keyboard. So, well, hang on a second. How does No Man's Sky do it? No Man's Sky use VR to fly the ship and and walk around. That's a gamepad game. <laughs> okay. 
And again, you know, you could do the same with with, with Elite. You could set up your gamepad and, and oh. you could integrate it that way. But um, I've always found that whole, you know, if you if you've got a VR headset that you've got your nostril and you just push your nostril in a little bit to see the keyboard and <laughs> look down the side of your nose, that was always my way in the older VR. But I, I don't. I genuinely think that the secret to using VR. And whether or not VR is appropriate for a frontier FPS or whether it just would be barf inducing um, would be to introduce a control mechanism of switch where that you can change mode and that allows you to change your headset off to use a screen or and have that kind of integration <laughs> in the game where it takes account of that or if the FPS is um, particularly engaging. The majority of VR now has uh, a range of controllers that you can see in the VR, uh, and therefore I don't think it would be, well maybe it would be a little bit kind of fourth wall smashing if you were, hold on a minute I'm going to chase you, and then a, a Playstation 4 controller appears on your desk and you pick it up in game, so I don't know if that's quite fourth wall breaking, but the technology is definitely there to support the ability to use a wide range of different controllers, and to get tags um, for your different controllers, so that you can avoid spillages and things now um, whereby when you are close to an object um, certainly the cosmos does bring in the borderlines and you can make out I can read bottles I can read the label of bottles in this strange lined out world uh, is fairly phenomenal so hopefully as that technology progresses these kind of concerns become less of a, an issue hopefully <laughs> Um, Mr. Ron wants us all to be Daleks because he says that's the future of us all. Because <laughs> we can't handle stairs, apparently, <laughs> in VR. I think the point, though, do you to think we... Sorry, I was about to bring up the VR subject in Elite and uh, that. Is... Can I very quickly, think... before you dive into that, right, Sean, can I very quickly yeah. uh, say about... Um... Oh, uh, blah, 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 Mr. Rollins thing that I've actually, I wouldn't be very surprised if we are all flying skimmers instead of actually walking about because controlling a skimmer makes so much more sense when you're traveling in zero G or a low G planet than actually walking. So we won't be Daleks, we'll be Davros. <laughs> you know, give us a, give us Davros, uh, give, give us a skimmer with a couple of wee hands. And maybe guns. Why not? Well, what's the difference between that then and um, driving around in the SRV? Possibly because, very little. you know, the whole point it's of space legs was you were supposed to walk. Yeah, use I, I, your I legs. To totally agreed, but it's just, it's just something I was thinking about. Anyway, on to Shan's thing. Yeah, Shan. Yeah, um, it kind of relates to what Ben said actually about sitting in the skimmer because I, I know people have. have um, argued the opposite, but from my experience, it's very difficult to make a non nausea inducing way of locomotion that isn't teleportation in VR. Uh, and then I, I asked the question to myself will Frontier spend the effort to actually make a walking movement and the models and textures and stuff like that to enable you to look around and fight? in VR, or will they say, well, actually, or will you not be able to do it because they haven't developed it? Particularly mm. if it's going to be, particularly if it's going to be on consoles as well, because I don't know if we know whether the PS5 will support PSVR, but we, we know, I think the Xbox definitely doesn't. So it's such a niche thing at the moment. I'm just wondering if they'll look at the, the time and effort required to do it and go, no, I would better off polish the game. Well, No Man's Sky has done very well out of the fact that it supports um, PSVR. Uh, that's actually been quite a um, a surprise for people. So, I mean, I would hope that Elite Dangerous would support PSVR on, on the PlayStation Five, because uh, I, I think that would open up that game the game to a whole load of. Um, new people who have never experienced the joys of Elite Dangerous and VR. And, uh, yeah. But, yeah, I, I'm kind of getting off topic here because I, 
I know what you mean, Sham, because the only way that I, when I've played um, Half-Life Alex, couldn't walk around. I had to teleport, even though you had the option to walk around. But teleporting, to be honest, once you get used to it, I, I think it is still a valid play style. I mean, but the expert, I think, would be um, Grant. You've, you've probably had the most VR experience of the lot of us. Uh, teleport, uh, no, I'm trying to think. There was a number of different games that have come out, um, and there was a particular one um, that had a combination. Uh, for example, you've got Pulsar, and moving around in that in first person was quite vomit inducing for me uh, mm-hmm. originally but obviously the VR's come along I've not gone back and looked at that since but the the teleportation and then a rotation quick rotation or a smooth rotation options on the old Vive controllers was actually quite enjoyable so um, I think it was was it Doom VR and you yes it was Doom VR you could then jump and turn shoot jump and turn shoot and it wasn't so horrible in your mind that it caused you to have grief. I'll tell you what the big one was. It was actually um, Player Ready Player One. Mm-hmm. When they did their VR software, it opened up the benefits of all the different controls. Uh, and again, I've also played uh, recently as well, uh, another one where you do have that freedom of movement and it was actually okay. It's just the, it's the conflict between... Uh, gun sight and head sight that is where your personal choices need to you need to be able to choose so whether or not you don't mind being able to run in a straight line and then strafe your gun to the left and the camera follows your gun and not your head or whether you want it to follow your head and use the guns and still move in another direction. There's so many combinations for that particular scenario so you know you, you are running in a straight line you've got an enemy to your left and an enemy to your right do you want to look left and the gun look left? Or do you want your gun to be mm-hmm. controlled by you so you look left naturally, move your controllers, point at that weapon, shoot that way, look right, see them coming, swing your weapon all the way around is the most natural for me, but other people would probably prefer that where they look the crosshairs are. So, I mean, it's, a, it's an endless list of potential nightmares and everywhere does do it differently but I think I agree that teleporting you get used to quite naturally, I think there was was there a Pulsar? Um, not Pulsar, what's the other one? Uh, go, oh, Portal uh, VR demo and it was quite natural too but get it right it feels okay, get it wrong and it feels like you're stuck so you feel like a static object and that can be quite yeah. unpleasant. Yeah, that's how I felt. It's it. Well, I I mean, I haven't played any of the new VR. I haven't VR games. So I haven't played Alex yet. But mm-hmm. it always sort of felt as though it was a uh, power defense game where you are the tower. So you teleport somewhere, you shoot bit, you teleport somewhere else, and then you then you're the tower. Then you shoot somewhere. Else. There's not that fluidity of movement that you. That is an integral part of an, F- of an FPS. And I haven't well, seen a game that does that yet. Well, actually, I would recommend that you play Half-Life Alex then. Because that, for me, um, we, we, I played it down. We've got VR stores. Because all the shops in Stockport have shut down. They've now opened up these VR experience shops where people will come in and you can actually try out demos of, of, of things. Uh, and... Uh, one of the things that we, we tried in there was um, uh, Half-Life Alex, And that, I think, is is the closest we've gone got so far to um, feeling like a proper FPS in in, in VR so far. I've, um, I've played Alex, and I'm, I don't know, about 10 hours in, and it's got a lot of options for movement. And I found the locomotion where your left hand that you don't have your gun in is the direction that forward moves. So you can strafe and you can run backwards, forwards, but you can also jump in that game. So you can also, you can have teleport and locomotion at the same time. And and it makes it really, really easy to move around. And if you start getting sick, you can just start teleporting. But I've got, you know, two years of VR under my belt. I don't get the motion sickness anymore. (laughs) You're acclimatized to it. 
Yeah, you kind of get used to it after a while. I mean, even the vomit buggy in this game, the first couple times I did it, was a bit much, and now now I, it doesn't phase me at all. Uh, it's, a, it's a case of you, you have to get used to looking at a certain place so that you don't... You, it doesn't have that um, vomit response, really, isn't it? And I think it's just the back of your mind is starting to learn that when you've got that headset on, it's not real real you know your your equilibrium doesn't get out of whack and you start getting that motion sickness because your brain realizes i'm not actually moving just looks like i'm moving and and eventually it just kind of goes away but if you get super sick early on in vr there's a chance you won't ever put a vr headset on again so if you start Mm -hmm. feeling it just get out (laughs) that's my suggestion I mean, can you see, um, say, a, an engine, similar mechanics in Half-Life Alex working in, say, combat, like, against the Thargoids in, in that kind of way? Absolutely. I mean, that, when you get into Half-Life little ways, you start fighting multiple enemies and, like, these construction zone areas where you're trying to duck down behind stuff and climb up over something and jump behind something. And, you know, you're trying to not get shot and you're trying to shoot and it's, it gets quite hectic and it it would probably be fun against aliens. Then again, I, I am one of the people that doesn't even want that in only dangerous, but if they do it right, I, I could see it being fun. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, that. Uh, every time we bring up this subject, they, we do get a lot of comments in, in the chat room saying, I'd rather prefer them to do this. I'd rather prefer them to do that instead of getting to this point here. Um, it's, I mean, do you get the feeling that the reason that this is happening is because Star Citizen is doing it? It sure feels like it. No. We've, we've seen from all the way back in the Kickstarter... Mm-hmm. That elite feat or whatever you want to call it has been on in David Braben's wish list ever since he had the idea for for Elite Dangerous. So it might be that other games are doing it, and it feels like Elite is maybe being a little bit late to the party. Some mm-hmm. other people might say other games have been trying to do it for the past ten, well, since twenty thirteen, so the past seven years. And Elite Dangerous have put out a game and worked on this quietly in the background. Now, who knows if it's going to get it right? Certainly from playing Star Citizen, they've got a lot of right, but they've also got a lot of wrong. Um, we will see what Elite Dangerous gives us. Yeah, but I don't, but I don't think be... it's... I definitely do not think it's a case of them playing catch-up. I... Yeah. I got the, the, the kind of the concern that, you know... The the things that we've always loved in Elite is the big epic battles, you know. So you got a, a a massive space battle with lots of ships and how epic that feels. And I know that when you're in a combat zone, you get to that point where you've now taken out the majority of the enemy, and it kind of begins to feel a little bit empty. Um, and the concern for me is with the first person shooter styling. Um, if you can't deal with instancing then it's you're going to have to go for spectacular environments in order to compensate for that so uh, you know mm. if you can't have that epic uh, 42 person uh, on on a planet surface fighting the oncoming you know holding the line at a base as the thargoids come you know in with ships over the hill you're in your um your ground air defense guns you're firing up there from that side of the ship so you've got four of your friends running that you've got 10 of your friends as infantry ready for the oncoming you've got other guys in SRV or the equivalent battle vehicles that are there waiting for them to come over the crest of the hill and then mm-hmm. all hell breaks loose there you've got a uh, geek's orgasm of action right there perfect that game will be your game forever you will never forget the story writing that you've just made yourself in that particular instance if you then spend 24 hours trying to get everybody into that instance it loses that impact and if you can't get 
that kind of large scale first person collection in that game kind of like you know if you look at um, GTA for example as a prime example and you've got um, 16 players versus 16 players it's yeah. right it feels like you know life it feels like there's just an abundance and there's so much vibrant going on change that to four versus four and it kind of feels a bit empty you've got a whole planet what surface to run the... on it's been a while since I've played FPS so what's the usual map size in terms of numbers of players on well, in, in the, the battlefront, I would say a hundred, hundred. I would say yeah. having a hundred player maps is very common these days. Yeah, um, I, well, I it's the standard now, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. battlefront, yeah. battle uh, unknown player, un player unknown battlegrounds is PUBG, yeah. Fortnite, Call of Duty. They all have absolutely humongous maps. With helicopters, planes, vehicles, blah blah blah, and there's a hundred, hundred and fifty odd people in the map. But it's going they to be have that. But then, sorry, but they haven't then got all the other game uh, mechanics and cycles around that. They are designed to be indeed they're FPS pure FPS well, on a limited size map. They haven't got all the rest of the stuff going on. I don't know about that because if you think about it, you've got vehicles, and that's one of the big things that they tend to do an awful lot of work on is adding vehicles. And with you know, if you can imagine that the the perfect combination of um, uh, running a say a, taking over or attacking a high security base. And you've got your SRVs and troop carriers, you know, and then mm -hmm. you've got your airships coming in first, taking out the defences and fighting and engaging in any air defence. You've then run in your uh, ground troops um, to drop them into the area to, to basically attack the base. Meanwhile, your other defensive SRVs are taking on other targets that are mobile and skimmers, etc., I mean, you're you're talking about a proper full scale battle there, and that's only a teeny little segment of what Elite could offer. I mean, it would be um, if you get if you can get to that, if technology allows them to get to that, then what you have is a, a game defining genre that will basically put you know Frontier back on top because would it's that not the same then, in other games. Would that yeah? Would that then not be Elite anymore? Would that just would that be uh, like planet side or well no something like that? Against... Would, the, would that kind of yeah I know the, what you're the, saying the main conceit of elite the main conceit of, of elite is you're the lone commander in a ship that you know trying to make your way in a unforgiving impersonal galaxy and that's the main conceit of the game since 1984. If you then change that, does that take something away from from that? Well, I'm not sure. I'm just asking. You. Your your alternative is that uh, you know uh, essentially going to be that you are that rogue pilot um, propping up a stool in a bar, um, telling stories and drinking ales before going down and doing some shady deals in the inside of state of of, of um, stations. But who's to say you can't create um, the content in the same way that they currently do? So even uh, um, when you think of the instances. Of flying down and joining a battle instance, or a, there's a war in that particular one, or you stumble across a, a an unknown system signal source, and you find that there's a, a a battle going on there, and you drop into that. It's it's about having those unique opportunities for that kind of content on top of the sole pilot or the guy who just drives around in an SRV, sees a ca a cave. And gets out their SRV to go and have a wee solo cave um, hunt with their um, torch <laughs> on, staring at the sides of the cave and finding some weird looking eggs and thinking, gosh, what are they? And then you've got some more content when a Thargoid comes out your arse. But, you, you know, it's. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think the 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 the, the joy or the, the potential for Frontier is the fact that they can have the simplistic um, single pilot and your own hero telling your own story side, but also have the ability to bring in this other kind of content in the forms of using your narrative, using your community goals to say that there's going to be a battle, they've detected it, can pilots get here, we need so many troops, sign up as a, a tank driver, sign up as a base defence, and you hollow me into the systems there, and then it's kind of very similar to a ship or a turret, uh, and they've got those mechanics in-game to, to create that, it's just about 
the ability for that first person part to be engaging enough that it's not off-putting or jerky or, or not quite as fulfilling. So I think it doesn't have to be the be-all and end-all of it, uh, but having so the ability to have, put that in would be awesome. So would you have AI on bot for solo and um, yes. group? Definitely. Yeah, like NPCs now. I mean, the biggest problem I see with the the whole thing, you know, adding those extra levels is right now we can't even, you know, multi-crew in a wing. You know, I'd love, you know, if we get space legs, if you've got a battle on the ground, you know, like a battle royal going on or whatever, but you can mm-hmm. fly air support for that. You know, come in and shoot Shan with a rail gun while in my what? Corvette. You know, that would be fun. Me. Happy birthday, Shan. <laughs> There's a prime you know. example. You've got fleet carriers, right? So here we come in. Here's Shans, right? He's detected there's a hostile wing coming in, right? So we all come flying in with our, our guns our, uh, and, you know, Ben's got a, a Tesla uh, in the cargo bay ready to drop and uh, full of explosives um, to, to sort of, like, fire a Shans fleet carrier. But you come in and you, you get your, you know, get past the ship defences, you punch a hole and then... You drop your um, marines or your players, your wing. But yeah, you're right. The mechanics are not working for that kind of nesting of player groups and player modes. Um, but yeah. Yet. That's one thing that I did want to bring up, actually, is because the, the a lot of the things that we're discussing normally involves a lot of group play. Now, with a lot of players spread out across the the galaxy um can you and no man's sky get around this problem by having this this um central hub that all command all pilots have access to and they can all join up and do missions via this central hub but there's nothing in elite dangerous that could mimic that without really we get people complaining about the hollow me and Hollowing into other people's ships. Unless you had it like altered carbon, we sleeve into something from far away. <laughs> so and you, if you like, inhabit that body until it's killed, and then you sleeve somewhere. Basically, just remote control of the other bodies. Well, te- technically, I mean that's what we are. If anyway, because really. We should die when we lose our ships. Oh, we have plot armor. Well, I know we've got plot armor, but are we all just actually brains in jars and Shinatra Tesra, as, as, as Ben has pointed out before? Have you just exploded there, Grant? Maybe. Did you just explode on Shan's carrier? Maybe. Did Shan's carrier explode you? That's so sad. I'm <laughs> crying. Happy birthday. I, I missed it because I was, I was not... Oh, man. <laughs> I'm right next to Shan's carrier, you see. Who did it say you were killed by, by the way, Cal? Who did it say killed you? It just said I was destroyed. <laughs> the carrier got in. I think we can count that one up to Shan, can't we? Ah, thank, thank you for the birthday present, Cal. That really <laughs> freaked me out. <laughs> so, I guess at the moment... Are you all going to do that now? Sorry. Uh, everyone needs to go and get blown up by my carrier now. As a birthday gift. As a birthday gift. <laughs> I'm going there now, Shan. Actually, Ventura and me are right next to your carrier at the moment. Oh, tell you what, Colin, should we go and all blow up at Shan's carrier together? And that'll be the end of the show. <laughs> <laughs> oh, until we get all, until we get re-sleeved in different bodies. Yeah. Right, well, um, I think we're going to have to call this one uh, a little bit earlier than normal, because I think until we've got more information from Frontier, from Frontier, we're kind of just... It could be anything. 
So um, I'm going to move on to uh, any other bit of the community corner. Um, well, the only real thing that I've discovered in the last uh, couple of days is um, the YouTuber, the pilot, has put in, uh, has done a review of the Federal Corvette. Uh, has anybody else seen this one? Yeah. Very good. Very, very good. All his work is. Yeah, it's pretty. You know, the host over at Loose Screws, he's a bit of a fanatic for the Corvette, so I'm sure he's watched it 15 times. Yes. Yeah. He's, I'm, uh, this, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm getting uh, uh, interrupted here. Um, yeah, the uh, the Federal Corvette, it, he certainly goes into a, a great deal of detail with it. And uh, as usual, it's the, the, uh, the production values are absolutely fantastic. Um, before I proceed on any further, has anybody got any other business that they'd like to just quickly bring to uh, bring to the uh, to the fore for I give out the shout outs and and call out Mr. Mr. Wotherspoon. I don't know if you can see the the question there from Guy Zen about saying uh, the uh, no comment on the AX base name change. Um, what is the AX base name change? Does anybody know? It's in the Discord chat. Basically, they've gone off and renamed the AX base in the beta. I'm not sure if it's if it's visible beta or if it's just uh, by data mining, uh, which is why I've been a bit reticent, but it's been renamed to one of the names of the Four Horses of the Apocalypse. Ooh. Um, right. I think it's Pale, Pale Rider or something like that. Um Okay, well, but, if, yeah. If it's not a, a sort of an official pale horse, yeah, visible. Yeah, then we'd I, probably I, I don't know. I don't know how visible it is, and I've been steering away from it. And this um, was the first I had heard of that, so I didn't. I I wanted to sink in and think about it before I tried to comment on it. Yeah. Okay. How come I've got a 150 credit fine for? Come on, oh, that's you, Shan. I should have known. You just ran me. What did Shan do to you? Oh, uh, it ran me. I'm now down to twenty-two percent. Mm. Oh, I'm I'm seven light seconds away from the ship. Yeah, I, I was hoping I'd last long enough to to for the end of the show, but never mind. Mm. Yeah, I'm I'm trying to avoid a Corvette and an Anaconda. Yeah. I'm being interdicted by something. <laughs> so, I mean, <laughs> that could be just them having a laugh, to be honest. And isn't Pale Pale Horse the name of the Clint Eastwood character? Or is that is that just that the Pale Rider? Pale Rider. Oops. <laughs> but pale there, there horse is was a quote on Tombstone that um... the priest called. Like the cowboys or something like that. I Personally, know. I prefer pale ale. <laughs> I'm with you, man. Um, only thing I'd, I'd like to add is uh, invite anybody who wants to get into some CQC other than the CQC Discord can come over to Loose Screws. I'll hop in CQC with people, and we're going to be running some events over on Loose Screws where we're doing it as a squadron. So come on over, have some fun. We're also going to be doing some canyon racing and stuff like that. We're going to just, I don't know, start having some more activities because as uh, Phoenix mentioned, there isn't a lot going on, um, not a lot of news, and we need to find our own fun. Yeah. I mean, Thank you for going... having me. Yeah, it's, it's your it's absolute uh, pleasure to have you, Jake. It really is. Uh, we're right. going to have to organise a a live radio versus loose screws uh, CQC match at some point. And and considering I'm the only one that plays CQC, you you'll probably wipe the floor with us. So well, Atris fifty sixty uh, keeps ducking me. So I have played with him before. So get him get him in, and and you guys come in. We could do some team deathmatch or something. <laughs> okay. Um, 
Well, quickly, um, we'll give our usual shout-outs. So, um, to our sister station, Hutton Orbital Radio, it broadcasts on a Thursday at uh, 8.30. You can tune in at tv.forthemug.com or if, if you just want the audio, at radio.forthemug.com. Um, for the discerning commander who likes a bit of CQC action, um, in addition to the loose screws, there's also the CQC Discord to help you out at discord.me slash CQC all one word um, of course following this we hopefully have a, gal uh, a galnet news by commander Wotherspoon uh, yep, excellent and we'd just like to thank everybody who's chipped in at the twitch chat and the in-game commanders and I'm just going to say this thank you to um, my internet provider for actually being able to work today <laughs> So um, that's it for another episode of Lave Radio. If you'd like to get in touch with the show, you can email info at laveradio.com, hit us up on facebook.com slash laveradio, tweet us at at laveradio. You can join our Discord server by going to discord.io slash laveradio. We have a TeamSpeak server where commanders come to hang out and chat, and you can find that at teamspeak.laveradio.com. Now, do get in touch if you've got any questions or if there's anything you'd like us to discuss in a future episode. Live Radio is recorded live on a Tuesday evening at uh, 8.30 and streamed out on laveradio.com slash live. So thanks to Grant, thanks to Ben, thanks to Shan, and of course, thanks to Commander Chig. Uh, until next time, Commanders, fly safe. But if you can't do that, fly dangerous. seconds I'll be right back Galnet News Digest 19th of May 3306 we read the news so you don't have to in this week's news, fleet carrier Neutron Boost setback. Base building has arrived. Skiffy Mart makes it easy. Signs of life stretches credibility. And Lave loses the con. Fleet carrier Neutron Boost setback. After Canon Research spent months attempting to get their megaship the Gnosis inside the cone of a neutron star to see if its jump drive could be supercharged, two fleet carriers have managed the feat within days, and one of them belongs to Canon Research. The incidents happened during the second fleet carrier test drive, which is about halfway through. When jumping to a known system, it's easy enough to pick a harmless planet to go into orbit around, such as the planet of death, or SCAR-D1. But if you're jumping to an unmapped system, 
you're going to end up orbiting the main star. And if that star is a neutron star or a white dwarf, you stand a fairly good chance of ending up somewhere fairly interesting. If you end up inside the cones, you can probably take off in a ship. And if you're lucky, you can get the frameshift drive to charge. But you stand very little chance of being able to land again. If your fleet carrier ends up inside the exclusion zone, which is what happened to Commander Mullen Riker at the Chaluia White Dwarf, you won't be able to do anything at all other than appeal to the Astronomical Association for a tow truck to haul your carrier to a safer location. It does not appear that either of the affected fleet carriers had their frameshift drive supercharged by the experience. However, Canon is continuing its research into the potential for a 2000 light year fleet carrier jump. Base building has arrived. According to Commander Plater, fleet carriers may well be the bases we've all been waiting for. Who would want a static planetary base when you can gather your fleet together in a fleet carrier and fly the base to wherever it's needed? Commanders test driving their new bases have discovered that wing trade bonuses can be a highly profitable way to conjure credits out of thin air. They can buy and sell to their own fleet carrier at whatever price they like and without losing any money, and their wingmates get a 5% bonus just for being nearby. Meanwhile, fleet carrier owners are getting mildly frustrated that they have no means of advertising what they're looking to buy or sell. As the captain of the fleet carrier, seeking performance enhancers, explained, if a commander jumps into a system with six fleet carriers, there's absolutely no way to tell which, if any, of the carriers are interested in buying your low-temperature diamonds. The captain of the fleet carrier Get Your Meta Alloys Here agreed, saying that it's all very well seeing a system three jumps away that has a fleet carrier in it, but if you don't know what services are available, you're really not going to make a detour to visit it. Someone should write an app for that. Skiffy Mart makes it easy. In what the author describes as a blatant rip-off of down-to-earth astronomy and hawks, Commander Skiffy has published an updated list of materials and where to find them, together with links to the evidence. Commander Skiffy explains that his only contribution was adding links to EDDB, and that's because he's too lazy to do research. The blatant rip-off can be found at bit.ly slash 2 capital A capital I capital O lowercase PLB. Signs of life stretches credibility. The Buckyball Racing Club's Signs of Life event has concluded with victory in the Regulation DBX class for Commander Alec Turner, who managed to visit nine different life forms, one more than Commanders Aiken B and Elastul Marfer, who visited eight apiece. There's a steward's inquiry into the Unlimited class, with Commander Sulu taking second place having visited 16 different lifeforms. But way out in the lead, Commander Shea Blackwood claims to have visited 61 different lifeforms in less than 66 minutes. We hope he didn't visit a single pumpkin patch and count each pumpkin as a different lifeform. The matter is still under investigation. Lave loses the con. The annual get-together of commanders known as LaveCon has been cancelled this year after a severe case of outbreak affected the venue, Planet Earth. The organisers explained that it might have been possible to proceed with the event if those attending observed social distancing. However, there was concern that there might be dangerous overcrowding during the book readings, and it was for this reason that the event 
was called off. LaveCon 3307 will be held on the 3rd and 4th of July next year. And that's this week's Galnet News. Galnet News, we read the news so you don't have to. <laughs>